Okay, so uh, thanks Emily and delighted to have you on board today um, for this interview for my LinkedIn Winning Through group. Thank and you. Um, I know it's going to be another fascinating interview because uh, I think you've got some interesting stories to tell and you've clearly been spending your time very wisely over the last few months and done some great things. So firstly, Emily, just give us a little bit of background on um, uh, your career to date and how you got to where you are. Yes, thank you, Steve. I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, so I started my career basically off the back of university. I'd done a degree in popular music record production. Um, I really got enthused by the events industry that way. However, at the time it wasn't a financially viable option. So I retrained in HR, I was working in property, recruitment and hospitality all alongside studies. Um, coming out of university, I did my COPD qualification and went into recruitment and HR reward. So very much working on the employers and getting everyone through the door in terms of interviews and CVs. Um, then moved into administration in relation to children's social care, so very high-end legal documents, and moved back to recruitment, training, and apprenticeships after that. So quite a wide range of subjects. Oh, mate, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, come the end of my last job role, I, I basically decided one day that um, helping people was more important than achieving targets and that was my personal value that I wanted to focus on. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I came up with my business which is Pair of Hands Business Services. Brilliant. Um, Brilliant. So just coming up to a year for that now. Um, very much on the uh, down low because of lockdown and COVID. Um, very much a redundant... Uh, sorry, <laughs> I can't speak when I'm being recorded. It always happens. <laughs> So, um, yes, I was very much in the event sector. I was helping businesses represent themselves at expos. I was going along setting up for murder mystery dinners and corporate events. And sadly, due to the current situation, that's not been able to carry on. So given my background with the HR the recruitment and everything, I uh, started offering that to small business owners and very quickly realised there are a lot of people who are in need of support right now. Absolutely. So, um, so tell me how the, the pair of hands came to be in terms of a name. Was that your idea or that come up through discussion with other people? Funnily enough, um, the day I decided to go self-employed, I sat there, head in hands. What could my business be called? I know I want to help people. I know I want to do this. And I went, pair of hands. <laughs> I am a pair of hands. I want to be a pair of hands. So that's how it came about. And um, I actually got married last year and I'd built up quite a good following on my maiden name, but no one knew who Emily Alexander was. And if you Google Emily Alexander, you'll find some Instagram model that isn't me. Um, <laughs> so I had to find a way to stand out and that was instant marketing for my business. It just, just fit nicely. Yeah, no, that, that, that's so... Straight away, we have a, a fabulous nugget for anybody watching this, the, the uh, power of positioning yourself by a very simple strap line. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, very that was lucky. So it was all going well. And then um, COVID happened. So tell at well, what point did you start to think, well, hang on a minute. Um, if I don't do something differently, if I don't pivot, then I'm not going to have a business. So for me, it was a gut reaction as soon as the announcement for lockdown happened. I'm very much one of these people who reacts first and then deals with the consequences afterwards. <laughs> I'm a change champion, I think they call it. Um, so I, I instantly went back to my website, my branding, my offering and thought, well, what are my background skills and experience and what do small business owners need? So I started offering support with first time hires. So making sure an employer knows that they're working within the law, that they are shortlisting properly, that they're not being discriminatory in advertising, all those basic things that you wouldn't necessarily have come around before. Um, so what, I've helped one or two businesses. Sorry, sorry, what did that. you find just out of interest? 
um, I've, I've had one or two businesses come forwards with support needed. Um, you're finding about 500 people applying for one job at the moment, which is extremely overwhelming, particularly if you haven't got the time to sit there and reply to each one or read each one in detail. So, um, no, I wasn't meaning that so much. I was thinking, right. more, did you find that a lot of small business owners didn't have a clue about um, uh, legal aspects of recruitment? I'm still finding that yes, that is sadly the case. Um, generally, it's a, a gut instinct that they go for in their first time. They have all the legal paperwork in place, but their processes for selecting and scoring people or um, even in the way that they advertise probably isn't fully in line with what the government would recommend. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's something that is a sore point for businesses, I think, but they may not even be aware that it's there. Yeah, no, I, I'm sure you're absolutely right, which is why I yeah. mentioned it, uh, Emily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you, you you sort of changed tact a bit, and um, um, you know what what have you found in terms of uh, working with small businesses that they actually what's their main need? Um, to be honest, right now they are needing someone who can do sales who can bring them in customers most small businesses i work with or know through networking um have all been very negatively affected by covid i haven't had anyone who's making hand sanitizer or things like that um marketing and advertising budgets are reduced they need support with social media but they don't know how or have the time um it's, it's along those lines it's just everyone's a bit up in the air at the moment they don't know where or how to prioritise best to keep their business going. Yeah. And so with your wide ranging business skills, uh, clearly this has all come to, to help you. Um, and so you're, are you doing social media marketing for business, small businesses then as well? It's not something that I'm a specialist in. And normally if a business owner came to me and asked me for specific advice or guidance or a strategy, I would signpost them to a marketing expert. Um, but if it's a case of helping schedule some posts online or pull off some data from a website, I'm, I'm doing that a few times with a few different yeah, businesses. So, so. The scheduling angle and so, so use again, using skills you developed from the events industry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. So, um, in terms of how we came to meet, uh, I think it's useful for people watching this to, to know because we've only known each other probably a, about a month. Um, yes, about that, yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, it's interesting because when I, when I do these uh, interviews, it, it's um, invariably it's been with people I've known for years, but there have been one or two people like yourself, Emily, where I've literally come across them on LinkedIn. We've had an immediate rapport and commonality of thinking and uh, that's resulted in um, doing a, 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 an interview uh, initially for the Winnie Through group but but something that's got broad appeal mm. because what I was particularly interested in aside, aside of your uh, your business strap line um, was how you have pivoted I could tell that there's obviously been a pivot and the pivot is seems to be the in word uh, mm. lockdown and my experience is people and businesses who've been able to do that are the ones who have been surviving and to a degree thriving mm. whereas those who are still burying their head in the sand and there's probably loads of them they won't have too much sand to bury their head into so um you know it is important that well i funnily enough on a linkedin post today i've said in challenging times people need to think differently which is a sort of um strap line i use a lot uh, mm -hmm. lately in, in some of my webinars as well uh, but it's true isn't it so yeah, we met as a result of um myself posting or joining and then posting on um your redundancy support uk Facebook group. Because yes. <laughs> as somebody who has been supporting people through redundancy myself now for 18 years and written a book winning through redundancy and got a course on it as well. Uh, I was, I was 
really interested to see what was out there in terms of supporting people. And I have to say, as you've probably found yourself, Emily, it's sort of many and varied. Uh, some of it is really not great at all. Mm. Uh, a lot, just a lot of whinging. Um, whereas your group clearly has got uh, a very definite aim of helping others, like you're saying, is a key part of who you are. So tell me how it came to fruition and how it's all working at the moment, Emily. So the redundancy support page was a little idea I had on Facebook about a month ago. And the idea was that I saw in the news the word redundancy popping up four or five times a day and I thought, oh dear, here we go. And it very much feels like we've gone back to the 2007 recession. And at that point, I was coming out of university. Everyone was quite worried about the opportunities available or how easy it would be to get a job. I ended up maybe working in lots of industries that weren't necessarily suitable for me at the time because it was just getting a job. Yeah. Um, further down my career path, I've also been made redundant myself. So I have been through the process and it isn't fun. It really isn't fun you go through the steps of bereavement because you lose part of your identity. Yeah. Your, your money income is suddenly questioned. Everything that you know about your current life is put in the air. Yeah. Um, so a combination of supporting people with mental health, again, something that I've been suffering with over decades, um, supporting people with information and their rights around redundancy and all that comes with that, so being able to save your money um, more effectively, being able to identify gaps in your personal development or career that you need to work on or improve in order to move down the next career path. And even knowing the basic rights in the first place, have you been consulted by your employer before you were made redundant or was it a WhatsApp message the day of? You know, things like that. I wanted it all to be in one place, easy to find, instant messaging, there, for example, citizens advice are absolutely fantastic, but they, if not already, but have in the past, have had waiting times of it. And when you're in an appeals process for redundancy, you only have a limited window. So they don't oh, necessarily- You just froze there for a second, Emily. Waiting times of how long? At five days to start with for the citizens advice to hear from an advisor, which when you're in the redundancy, a profile, uh, Redundancy appeal process can take five, you only have five days to appeal. So if you have to wait, no, not very helpful. Um, sadly, that's, they're, they're just resources are stretched to their limits already, let alone considering the fact that tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, will now be adding to that list. So I just thought it's a, it's a resource that organisations can share and use, employers can share and use, and individuals can access and hopefully everything they need is there and if not they can message me and i can unpick or defog the process for them and identify what area of support they need brilliant i mean i think it's absolutely fabulous and uh, you know from for somebody myself who since lockdown has been spending a huge amount of time giving my time uh, to things like my winning through group and uh, doing a lot of stuff for free to to help people in these challenging times i think it's marvelous but what are you finding in the group that is the, what are the big issues? What are the real um, challenges, the main challenges? I mean, I know you could probably have an A to Z list, uh, Emily, but give me the top two or three things that people are really struggling with. The main things are understanding and communication around the redundancy process, particularly that's from, where- that's from the employer to employee. Yes, employer to employee communications yeah. are not as clear or transparent as they could be. Yeah. Particularly in larger organisations where there's several people in the chain of command. That's the message from HR, which may be very clear and very helpful, is being watered down or almost ignored. And it's just a piece of paper that's given to the employee at the end rather than the full conversation. Really? Now, that's really it's interesting because I always say to people, Emily, that don't assume your employer, regardless of who they are and how large they are, is actually doing things by the book. 
they're often cut corners. So yeah. what you're saying is it might be something that it might not be HR who cutting corners. It might be somewhere in the line management chain that they're trying to make things quicker, which is often my experience. They want to get people out the door, would not they? So they're trying to shortcut things and then something goes by the wayside. Um, but people need to be aware of what they're in, what the process should be, don't they? And we have got a section for employers on there, one of the businesses who is collaborating with us, and we have um, over 20 local small businesses to me and UK-wide um, supporting this project in terms of being experts. Um, they are providing settlement agreement support and HR process support for anyone who's going to be making redundancies including best practice on matrix scoring and that sort of thing as well so there is another side to this but it's not fully developed yet yeah See brilliant. Okay. So, <laughs> give me a couple of other examples where, where, where the main issues aside of the employer employee communications i mean i'll tell you what i've noticed but you tell me first um there has definitely been some confusion around people coming off furlough or their end dates and when they should be receiving their payment dates. Uh, one or two people going through either maternity leave or expecting and really unsure where they stand. Again, employers weren't too certain on that. Um, what I think we will see is that more people are struggling to apply for jobs and that they'll be going for startups, but at the moment it's more that they're going through redundancy. They haven't started going at that end yet. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a case of wait and see, but at the moment it's very much the employer-led communications that have been creating issues for individuals. Yeah, uh, this whole issue, I, I mean, to be honest, I'm not even certain of it, uh, of when somebody becomes unfurloughed and when their redundancy kicks in, seems to be an absolute minefield, doesn't it, Emily? It really does, and even then I'm no expert, I'm not legally qualified, so... Um, as much as I could advise someone, you know, there is a contract, there are terms and conditions that you have already with your employer. If they're not following them, then you need to ask questions. Yeah. I mean, it's very evident from your group and also other groups that uh, I belong to um, that employers, some employers are clearly cheating the system mm -hmm. and they're not paying people up until their proper redundancy leaving date. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I can see this is a, a reoccurring thing. But the other aspect which you haven't mentioned, which I'm surprised at, Emily, um, is this whole um, mental health, uh, or what I'd call it emotional health, mm -hmm. to be honest, um, aspect of redundancy. And it's something I spend a lot of time on with my clients and on my courses, just getting people to understand there is no right or wrong way to feel um but you see people posting us and i saw it on um uh on one site today i can't remember if it was yours or another one uh somebody who who um has just um, uh, secured a job which is fantastic and having now secured that job they realized all the mistakes they've been making for the past few weeks and they shared it with the group which is fabulous that's brilliant so i then added to it with my two pennies worth um, because it's important that people understand this because the biggest mistake I see people making is spending, well, this woman reckons she was spending 15 hours a day job searching on online job sites and job boards. Think, um, it's so course. difficult. It really is so difficult. Applying for a job is a full-time job in itself. Um, mental health wise, I haven't had people approach me saying they're struggling and I don't think that many will because most people who are going through a stress or anxiety situation tend to keep it inside until they see the information they need so the fact that all the resources are there on the page or on the website for them to access they can self access self refer they don't need to come through me but if they are feeling stressed or confused about the process or the situation they're in i'm always there to talk and yes, I wasn't suggesting yes. that they come to you personally, Emily, but, yeah. but uh, I, again, it's my experience that um, a lot of people aren't aware necessarily, especially if they work for a large employer, mm -hmm. that they have some sort of employee support line 
who mm -hmm. can help them with things like counselling. Yeah. Um, and for some people, at the outset, it's almost like, you know, obviously I'm a career coach and I support people through a process to get them from uh, the start of their redundancy through to whatever is next in their career uh, mm -hmm. and life. But for some people, they might not be ready for that process yet if uh, they really are struggling uh, emotionally, in which case um, it helps to have that counselling right at the outset so they can yeah. clear all this uh, stuff going on in their head and they can understand they, they you know, it's, they, they, it's not about them. It's unfortunate, you know, we're, we're living in a crazy world at the moment where mm -hmm. who knows what's going to happen next. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's very difficult for some people to come to terms with that because people naturally take it personally. And especially if they're living on the breadline anyway. Yeah, it's very high stress at the moment. Um, employer assistance programmes are fantastic and large organisations tend to have one and it should be in your contract or welcome pack. So make sure you go and look in there. Um, not all do, sadly. Um, it can be quite expensive for small employers to set us up. Yeah. So in that first instance, again, we can signpost if needed. But what I would say is if, if you're feeling stressed or anxious, just talk to someone. Please yeah. just talk to someone. Um, you're likely not the only one feeling that way. It is normal to feel that way. Yeah. And it's not, yeah. it's not who you are, it's just what you're experiencing at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is, uh, you know, I talk about, and I, I showcase it in my programmes, about the um, emotional roller coaster ride. And it is, uh, uh, the whole redundancy process is an emotional roller coaster ride. There is no right or wrong way to feel. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's important that people understand that right from the off. But the other thing I, I, I share with people all the time, and that's why your group is so helpful, Emily, is it's so important to get the right support network around you. And that could be a combination of people, supportive people, whether it's a career coach like myself, or it's a, a group like yours, or you know, just people you know who can boost you up. Um, you know, my experience when I went through my redundancy, which is what 19 years ago now, uh, I saw how easy it was to get in a collective of negative people who just bring each other down. Mm -hmm. Um, so it is really important to have those um, positive support networks uh, around you. So I applaud what you're doing. And um, so where's this group going? How do you see it evolving, Emily? Because it's uh, you started it in July, wasn't it? Yes, so early July was the Facebook page. Yeah. And last week we launched our website, mm -hmm. which is very exciting. Um, again, it's just a duplication of the Facebook page, but not everyone has Facebook, so we want the information to be accessible. Yeah. Since then, we are now part of the information sheet provided to anyone who's any employer who submits their HR1 form, which is the redundancy form announcing over 20 to the government. Um, the rapid response teams are from the Department of Work and Pensions, and it goes out to the employer with a list of resources, which are one for them and two for them to share with their employees. So we're, we're starting to appear on those lists in certain areas in the country. That's brilliant. Well done. We are working on some advertising and some promotion just to, again, get the message out and about. And then this week, I am in the process of creating a, a registration for this to become a CIC. So we'll have official standing, we'll be able to apply for grants and funding, which might mean we have some money for a hardship fund too, which will be lovely. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, I mean, things obviously are very different in this current climate. You mentioned about uh, 2007, Emily. Mm. Last big reception. I mean, my company was involved with a massive project um, which a recruitment company actually won as part mm. of a government funded project to help people back into work during that uh, time um, and they didn't have the means to deliver it um, so we teamed up with them and I think we had something like over 3,000 people through um, half day workshops over the best part of two years uh, which was fantastic uh, and we helped so many people to to really move on and also rethink their their careers 
Yeah. Um, but to my knowledge, there's nothing like that out there this time round. Um, not yet. Not, not yet. <laughs> but, but wouldn't it be great? That was my question. Wouldn't it be great mm. if it was? And if there's any way I can help you in that, that'd be brilliant. Well, it'd be something to look at. Um, one of the things, one of the signposting options that we've got, as well as your group, Steve, which is fantastic, is someone who helps with mindset in moving forwards. We've got someone who helps with advising and guiding around startups. If you want to start your own business for the first time, we have other CV and career coaches. We're going to be having giveaways and competitions around all of that. And a lot of links with organizations who support young people. So employability and training like the Prince's Trust, Radian and um, CSW, a Southern organization. So um, between all of those and the collaboration, between us we should be able to provide that service to anyone who needs it yeah brilliant well it's interesting because this time round as opposed to in 2007 the biggest chunk of people who are probably most likely to um, suffer the most are the young people uh, whereas last time around it was more the 40 plus people who were basically being told you know they they have a pass their sell by date. Yeah, um, so I know there are initiatives in place from the government, um, which I think are in conjunction with um, uh, the DWP and Job Centre Plus, mm -hmm. in terms of helping young people retrain and things like that. Um, but obviously, it's a very challenging time for for, for young people at the moment, and I'm sure it's going to shape a lot of people's. Uh, young people thinking about whether employment actually is the right way to go. Yes, and actually I've found that, well, through, through personal experience in the last few months, I worked with a lot of young people over the last few years in a mentoring job support capacity, and I've had two of the four approach me in the last six weeks, actually, asking to help them set up a business for the first time. Really? Wow. So I think startups are going to be the way forward. Um, whether or not the government will <laughs> continue to support startups will be another matter. But um, as an option moving forward, I think starting our own businesses is going to be much more plausible than getting employment for younger people. So we're going to start seeing new blood in the workforce, new ideas popping up, a lot more focus on green initiatives because they're all very heavily focused on environmental friendly, eco-friendly things yeah. as well. Um, so it'll be, it'll be very interesting. So watch this space. Yeah. Well, it's like everything, you know, and I say this on my webinars that in the time of crisis is always opportunity. And, uh, I think you're absolutely right, Emily, and uh, young people, not just looking at uh, environmental green initiatives, but also doing more meaningful work. And as my t-shirt says, doing what you love. Um, yeah which is, uh, you know, my great, uh, one of my great passions is supporting people to actually do something that they love rather than just doing a job. Yeah. Um, and that's something I've noticed since lockdown, Emily, I don't know if you're finding the same, uh, the amount of social media posts from people and some surprising people, some who've been working at very high executive level, who suddenly the light bulbs come on and they said, why am I doing this? Or mm. why was I doing this more the point? Because they lost their job as a result of redundancy. And they're now challenging uh, their whole ethos and, and, and values. And I've got a couple of guys on uh, my Winning Through Redundancies and Layoffs course at the moment. And it's incredible the similarity. They're probably 10 years apart or more in age but they've all they got to that point of realization where they're thinking, why was I following this path in the first <laughs> place? This is not who I am. It's not all about the money and the material wealth. It's actually about um, living the life I want to lead, doing work that I love, and having um, this working lifestyle that works for me. I mean, are you finding that as well, Emily? exactly the same so um it was quite interesting so through my coaching that i've had over the last few months um personal growth has been a big focus but it's it's definitely been a trend 
So what's happened is because the world has closed around us and a lot of the materialistic things that used to be important are not accessible anymore, people have started to recognise that the important things are who you live with, who you spend your time with and what you spend your time doing. And the money is just an extra bonus to allow you to keep that lifestyle. And I actually gave this guidance to my sister a few weeks ago. Um, in terms of choosing what you want to do in life, it's not what do I want my career to be? What job do I want to do? It's what lifestyle do I want to lead? And what job would I not hate doing that would allow me to earn the income to support that lifestyle? Yeah. And that's yeah. the mindset I think most people need to have going forwards now. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was very much... I came from a very academic background where it was, you will get a career, you will earn money, you will be successful because you earn money. And success isn't really down to money. It's a very personal thing. Absolutely. And um, that, that almost brainwashed way of thinking for the whole population really needs to change. It's so outdated now and it's not sustainable, especially yeah. not the COVID. It's wonderful to hear this from you, Emily, um, because success is definitely from what's within, as is happiness, you know, you can't create it, it's what's within. And um, the other thing that's uh, noticeable is, is something that I've been championing for many years now, and that's port the rise of the portfolio career. Now, you obviously mm -hmm. have a portfolio career, Emily, because it's all about earning income from different activities, different uh, income streams. Um, and for a lot of young people now, I mean, this is something I was saying pre-COVID, that a lot of young people will leave college or university and they won't ever have what they might consider a proper job. Uh, they do stuff, which is how mm. they might describe it. But most of that stuff they're doing is stuff they really enjoy doing and they're playing with different things. And they get a real kick out of seeing that they can play with different stuff and actually make money from it. I mean, how cool is yeah. that? And then obviously they gravitate to certain types of activities that um, they enjoy the most or things mm -hmm. that people will want the most of. And I think that's, again, that's, that's something that's um, happening more and more since lockdown. The reliance on one job or in self-employment, one type of work activity, you're absolutely screwed basically when something like a pandemic comes along, especially yeah. if you don't have some sort of online presence. Um, so all of these things are, I think they're massive changes, aren't they? Yes, I think it is. Uh, the, there's going to be a huge cultural shift in way that we look at work moving forwards. Um, a lot of people are starting to sign up to MLM companies and trying to get a bit of extra income from selling healthy shakes or um, what was the other one? Energy comparison, um, which is fine so long as you understand the risks involved with that. Yeah, for people who don't know what MLM is, it's multi level marketing, uh, otherwise known as network marketing. And yeah, yes, always dressed up as something else. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and it, it's like everything in life. There are good and bad. I, I know people both in my contacts, uh, clients, and also family and friends who, who have been hugely successful in multi-level marketing uh, for many years and absolutely love it. Mm. You have to be a definite sort of type of person to make a success of it. And it's, it's not like um, a lot of these um, uh, marketing uh, suggestions show that uh, it's a get rich quick type scheme you have to work Definitely bloody not. hard to make it work yeah and I think that's the problem a lot of people think oh my goodness I can make money just doing this like one hour a week no um, it's not going to work if you just spam everyone with an email and expect them to reply yeah. you need to have you need to be giving away information you need to be regularly communicating with your customers targeting the right people not pushing sales it's for me it's a bit of a minefield so i don't want to go into that too much yeah, really but i'm pleased we touched on it uh, uh emily because i didn't know we were but um basically it's no different to anything else you have to use a whole range of business skills and life skills to make it work it's not a it's not a quick fix 
no. And on that note, actually, sorry, um, just in relation to the multiple skills and everything like that, um, a conversation I've had with young people before has been, oh, but I don't have this experience. I don't have X experience. I haven't done this. When an employer is asking for experience, they want to know that you've got the basic skill set to do that, not that you've done that exact job role. Yeah. Um, yeah. So look at the transferable skills you've picked up from multiple opportunities you've had in the past, and that is your full capability, and that will be more enticing to an employer. Yeah, um, absolutely, absolutely right, Emily. And it's not even just about transferable skills, it's about no. people's attributes and their attitude as well. Yeah, um, very much so. What I call your true marketability, but we could, we could talk about that all night. <laughs> So on that note, let's bring it to a close. But what I'd like to know before I do that, Emily, is what's next for um, Redundancy Support UK and Emily? Well, um, Redundancy Support UK is currently in the process of being registered as a community interest company. So that will be really positive. We'll be able to support a lot more people through that. Um, for me, it's just keeping that running and making sure the application goes through. <laughs> and um, in terms of pair of hands, um, I'm still advertising, I'm still working with small businesses. So just keeping it running until some sort of normality returns and I can get back to events. Um, so, yes, and um, talking of multiple jobs, I'm also a cat sitter. So that's a nice little bit of side income and it's what makes me happy and I enjoy it, but it's not regular, it's not guaranteed, it's just. No, it's part yeah. of your working lifestyle. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's fabulous. Well, that's a nice note to leave on, isn't it? So <laughs> it's been absolutely delightful um, interviewing you, Emily. I, I had no idea what to expect, um, but it's been very illuminating. And I hope anybody watching this um, uh, will, will, well, we'll put um, the links to your um, uh, website on on. On below the uh, video uh, for the group and people can then access that and uh, really encourage anyone who's been affected by redundancy in any shape or form uh, and, and all, are you also encouraging people who are currently furloughed? Yes anyone who is potentially at risk of redundancy it's worth knowing what your rights are before the process appears in front of you so please do have a read through there's lots of information there's the standard links to the government website and ACAS on there as well yeah. sorry <laughs> <laughs> talk of the devil there's the cat okay well thanks a million Emily and um, uh, it's been great uh, uh, talking with you and I wish you every success with uh, Redundancy Support UK and um, all your new ventures Thank you very much, Steve, for having me here. Yeah, it's my pleasure.